we are very honored uh, to have with us today uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah Masha Feinberg to discuss the triple threat of Russia, China, and Iran. Um, it's a very timely discussion, as uh, many of you probably noted that Ukraine just announced a couple of hours ago that they are opening um, their, um, their, their front to regain the city of Kherson in the south of, um, uh, of Ukraine, close to the Crimea. Um, so um, it, 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 it couldn't be more timely than, um, uh, than that. Um, to say a couple of words about our uh, distinguished uh, speaker, um, Dr. Sarah Masha Feinberg is one of Israel's top experts on uh, Russian, Eurasian and Middle Eastern politics. She's a senior researcher and head of the Great Powers Research Program in Tel Aviv, University's Aspire Center for Air and Space Studies, where she focuses on Russian and Chinese policy in the MENA region. In addition, she serves as a lecturer at Tel Aviv University's Security Studies Program, and she's a visiting professor of Israeli affairs at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Dr. Feinberg previously served as a policy and strategic uh, issues advisor at Israel's Ministry of Defense, and she has carried out intelligence analysts uh, and reporting to a wide array of institutions. So welcome, uh, Dr. Feinberg. Um, welcome, uh, Sarah. Um, now about today's topic, um, a lot to, to discuss, uh, a, a new world order that might be created between China, Russia, Iran. Uh, Russia has determined to expand its war on Ukraine, uh, with the recent uh, assassination uh, of the daughter of a prominent ultra-nationalist figure of Russia. Uh, and of course, today, the announcements of the new offensive of Ukraine to regain Kherson. Uh, the war might, might be entering into a new and even more dangerous phase. Um, angered uh, by sustained US outreach to Taiwan, China seeks to further expand its influence to roll back American and Western global power. Beijing has long viewed the Middle East as a key region to actively counter US uh, and Western European interests. We're entering a new round of uncertainty regarding Iran's threat as the P5 plus one group of countries closes in on a new deal with Tehran with new text on the table. A new deal would open Iran's oil to the global market, providing cash for the regime to boost its proxy act act activities across the region. And of course, especially in Lebanon. Um, how do these nations working together complicate security for Israel and its allies in the Middle East and Europe? That's what we're discussing today. And um, well, uh, let me let me kick off with the with the first question to uh, to Sarah. Um, I would like to start with your current assessment of the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, we have seen a new phase, as mentioned, a new offensive that was announced today um, by Ukraine to regain the city of Kherson. Uh, the West is continuing its efforts to supply Ukrainians with weapons and training of new Ukrainian troops. So what's your assessment? Uh, where do we stand right now? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mati, for, for this invitation. Thank you, Randy, and thank you to David uh, Sigal and Larry Orberg for this opportunity to talk to this large and distinguished uh, group of the Friends of Elnet. So it's a privilege for me to to address you tonight from Israel. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the situational assessment of what is going on now in Ukraine, of course, we're in the midst of the fog of, the fog of war. There's a lot of informational warfare going on from the Ukrainian side and from the Russian side. But it seems clear that the Ukrainians have launched this long awaited counter-offensive in the South. They're shaping the operations in Southern Ukraine to prepare the battlefield for a significant counter-offensive that is ultimately meant uh, or designed to liberate the 20% um, of Ukrainian territory that are currently occupied by the Russian uh, Federation. It is believed that this counteroffensive will include air and ground operations. Um, and in particular, this counteroffensive is currently focusing on the city of Kherson. You remember this city, which is currently an area 
of vulnerability for Russian forces. This is the first city that was occupied by Russia in the days following uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, this counteroffensive, um, as you know, has been prepared for weeks. The Ukrainians have incrementally degraded Russian forces in the south with a focus on Crimea. You remember the explosions in Crimea, the attacks across Crimea, uh, targeting the Sarki uh, air base, other attacks targeting electric uh, stations, uh, ammunition storages. Um, and it was a systematic campaign led by the Ukrainians to degrade Russian uh, capacity and air support uh, to other Russian forces in Ukraine. Uh, de facto Crimea, since the beginning of the war, has served as a rear base to support Russian forces, to support Russian innovation uh, in the last month. So I'm very uh, glad to see this counteroffensive taking place. The Ukrainians are taking a huge risk. I mean, there is, a, according to experts, a 50% chance of success in this counteroffensive. And I just want to highlight the fact that there's been a long discussion and a dilemma among the Ukrainians themselves at the political and military levels on when this offensive should be launched. Now, the Ukrainians want to change the momentum. They want to change a potentially frozen situation that would force them to accept a status quo. They were afraid of the local consolidation of Russian power in the Zaporozhye region, in Kherson, in Luhansk, in Donetsk. And they were mainly afraid of the planned referendums. You know that President Putin announced that the referendums would take place soon. They were to take place in Kherson in September. And they were afraid of this um, Russian capacity to create legitimacy and to create a de facto, um, a institutionalized de facto Russian presence that would be very difficult to challenge uh, afterwards. I believe that the reason also for this, um, the choosing of this timing um, is uh, multi-causal. You've seen in the last uh, weeks, the Russian operational tempo that has, that has slowed down and the Russian ability to bring munition to the front. The US has pledged additional military aid to Ukraine, but Mati, you know that there is no official and public European pledge to um, provide uh, military assistance to Ukraine. And as you know, even some members of the German parliament said openly uh, that Nord Stream 2 should be reactivated. You know, the, the, the gas pipeline should work as planned. Third, winter is coming. So the Ukrainians want to use the momentum now before European countries will exert pressure on the Ukrainian side and say, hey, you stopped because we have a problem with the weaponization of Russian gas. They're also afraid of uh, Ukraine fatigue, this phenomenon that we've seen playing out in the US and in uh, Europe, even though according to the later surveys, uh, the Americans are showing few signs of Ukraine fatigue, but the Europeans um, are, uh, um, do have, do suffer from this uh, phenomenon. Um, so these were the main reasons why the Ukrainians, despite of all the risks, decided to take advantage of this transitional moment, of this key critical moment, with the hope of changing the battle lines, of changing the momentum, and changing the momentum is also, from a Ukrainian point of view, a way to shape the narrative and to um, attract additional 
uh, military assistance that will be needed in the battlefields. So the main question, Matthias, as we speak, is will this counteroffensive succeed? Can the Ukrainians succeed? First of all, uh, I wish them the, the best of luck. Slava Giroyan here. Um, uh, uh, victory for the heroes. Uh, but one of the main concerns when you look at this counteroffensive is that the Ukrainians trained extensively on defense for eight years between 2014 and 2022, but they have very little expense, the experience in conducting offensive operations. The second issue that they're going to have to grapple with is the issue of uh, arms, um, of ammunition. You know, this war in Ukraine is also an industrial war. Uh, the US and European countries do not produce enough ammunition to sustain a protracted war, a long offensive that would last for weeks, if not months. Uh, you know, it, it is about liberating uh, vast territories in the eastern and southern part of Ukraine. So how many more arms will they need? And will the United States and the European countries respond to their demands? Uh, and also another big concern is Russia's ability or capability in standing this uh, fight. You know, the Russian military was very clearly challenged in, bring, uh, in bringing ammunition to the front. Uh, but despite of this, the Russians um, don't have a sense that they're losing this war. So there is a, a psychological element that from a Russian perspective, not only can't they lose this war, but they're not losing this war. They don't see themselves as losing this war, the Russians have um, um, increased their manpower on the battlefield. You know, they have increased their troops by 137,000 people. They're bringing volunteers, they're bringing PMCs, Wagner groups. You know, it is as if the Russians were adopting the Ukrainian model of bringing volunteers to the front line. But this time, those volunteers are from the Russian prisons. Uh, the Wagner groups is, uh, are recruiting volunteers in the Russian prisons. And Russia still remains a power with a considerably latent military capacity. To quote uh, Russia expert Michael Kaufman from CMA. So this. Uh, is a major concern in terms of uh, the, you know, in terms of the Ukrainians capacity to really uh, change uh, the battlefield. There is another major concern, which I think is um, a huge concern for Europe and the Middle East is what will happen with the Zaporozhye power plant. The Zaporozhye power plant is being occupied by Russian troops. Russia is all the time in its informational warfare, creating uh, false, false flag uh, operations and is diffusing false information about alleged um, Ukrainian uh, strikes. Uh, the Ukrainians have um, attacked the Zaporozhye power plant in its vicinity, but it is one thing to have this power plant occupied by the Russians when there is no Ukrainian counteroffensive, but now with massive air and ground forces to be deployed, this is extremely hazardous. Mm -hmm. And even though it is fairly protected from conventional forces, this is still uh, a major concern in terms of military, human security in that area, and uh, more globally, human security in the, Euro in the Euro European borderlands and in the Middle East. 
and just <clears throat> Sarah too, because we I want to also go towards the, the Middle East as you already mentioned, but just a, a short uh, follow up question what you just said. How fast can this counteroffensive uh, uh, progress? I mean, is it something that uh, will take a couple of days, weeks, or, or what, what is your assessment? Um, first of all, um, nobody can tell. It is extremely difficult to do a forecast. And Mattis, as you know, uh, the Americans and the Europeans were wrong about their initial assumptions. And so were the Russians. Uh, you know, the, the Russians, Europeans, and Americans thought that this war would take two weeks or maybe one month. And now we are into the seven months. Uh, but in terms of forecast, you know, they're very different. For example, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg has warned that it could last for years. It could be a war of attrition. For example, Mattis, we could see this Ukrainian counteroffensive being fairly successful in the beginning until September, October, and then the Russians launching a major counteroffensive in the winter. And they, this would take us to an additional year of protracted war or war of attrition. According to other assessments, Russia's combat capabilities could be depleted in the coming months. We know that they have a problem of uh, long strike capabilities of drones. They bought some uh, hundreds, uh, allegedly bought some hundreds of UAVs from the Iranians in July. So this is very, very difficult to predict. The only thing that we can tell is that the Ukrainian war is a tragedy in the most in the purest sense of the term, what is the tragedy? Is it, it's when either side has the capacity or, or the will to change the situation. And this is exactly what is happening at the moment. Zelensky has no other better option than a major counteroffensive, and Putin has no option whatsoever but just winning that war or just um, uh, reframing this war into a low flame, uh, long operation that will ultimately destroy from within uh, Ukraine as a sovereign uh, political state. So that's the major issue. And this combination makes this war by necessity very lengthy or we could see another option. We could see that the you know we could see a moment when the Americans and the Europeans will just pressure Zelensky and say, you know, it's been very nice. You've been very very inspiring, but you know you will not do better than this. And we don't have enough ammunition to give you. Uh, we don't produce ammunition. Uh, with a sufficient rhythm, you know, war, we think of 21st century wars, uh, you know, we think in terms of electronic warfare and cyber attacks, but you need artillery and it needs to be produced and you need to fight the jets. And, you know, from an industrial point of view, I mean, it's going to win down. Uh, so we could see that scenario play out as well. So just take this as a as a as a bridge also to the to the Middle East and and Israel and um, and and Iran. Um, when you're talking about the, the 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 way this war is developing, the the possible length uh, of it, the the tiredness that might grow into the politicians in in Europe, uh, gas uh, the gas problems in the winter, the Americans. Um, Russia is still present in Syria. Uh, Putin's first foreign visit after the breakup of the war was to Iran, uh, quite a statement. So how would you translate these developments that you just described um, to, uh, to the Middle East, uh, Russia's role, Russia's impact, Russia's influence in, in, in the Middle East? And also, um, where does Iran come in in all of this uh, in relation to, to Russia? Well, um... First of all, Mattis, um, Russia's position as we speak in the Middle East has not dramatically changed. 
you know, in Russia's battle for legitimacy, the Middle East belongs to the rest. You know, uh, my colleague at Georgetown University, Angela Stent, wrote a beautiful article entitled uh, Russia, the West and the Rest. And the Middle East belongs to the rest in the sense that if you look at the map of the world, if you look at the nations of um, the, 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 the nations of the United Nations, you will see that 50% of the world's population has remained neutral when it comes to Russia's intervention in Syria, in, in, in Ukraine, and so has uh, stayed the Middle East. From the very beginning, Middle, East, Middle Eastern countries, of course, Iran, but also the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel, have maintained um, a, a fairly neutral position with nuances here and there that they haven't joined the Western sanctions. Uh, they're not banning Russians from coming. There are nuances, and we can just dig into those nuances nuances but by and large the Middle East belongs to this to those regional blocks such as Asian countries China and India and others uh, that have not um, made Russia a pariah state as a result of its intervention in, in in Ukraine and that is a huge public relations victory for Putin himself you know, for Putin in terms of support, winning is about not losing. And he has not lost, as of yet, the Middle East. And that's a very important uh, point. This also testifies, you know, more generally uh, to the Middle Eastern countries' increased capacity to showcase strategic autonomy. And I think it plays out also with uh, China, and this is a topic we can discuss uh, later. Um, so for in the short term, Russia has not, Russia's presence in the Middle East has not uh, been depleted, and it has actually been reinforced through a crystallization or a deepening of its alliance with anti-Western foes, and primarily with Iran. Since the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine, there's been an increased cooperation between Moscow and Tehran in coping with Western sanctions. Of course, on the basis of uh, Iran's long and rich experience uh, in circumventing economic sanctions. Uh, until the war in Ukraine, Russia uh, had a few taboos, I would say, when it came to providing sophisticated state-of-the-art weapons and military equipment to Iran. But now that Russia is under Western sanctions, it has nothing to lose. So another consequence is that Russia might feel free to offer Iran advanced military technologies, for example, such as Sukhoi 30 fighter jets or S 400s, that until now were considered to be taboo. It, were, it was considered to be taboo vis a vis the United States, the problem of the sanctions vis a vis the Saudis. Russian, the Russians wanted to keep the balancing act between Saudi Arabia and Russia and vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Another big issue is um, the providing or the alleged um, selling of Iranian uh, UAVs, of hundreds of U Iranian UAVs, uh, you know, during the visit of President Putin in Iran uh, with uh, um, Erdogan. Uh, so, why is it a huge problem? First of all, it's a problem for the Ukrainian battlefield. Russia has lost a lot of drones and the Iranian drones uh, might impact the battlefield. And ultimately we will see 
Iranian drones confronting Turkish drones, you know, in Ukraine, uh, which testifies to the influence of the Middle Eastern countries in the Ukrainian battlefield. But the second problem is that, you, as you know, Mati, one of the key security issues in Israel is now the issue of drones. Uh, last March, uh, you, may, you may remember that two Iranian drones uh, intended to explode in Israel, and they were actually shot in Iraq by American fighter jets. Uh, last July, um, uh, uh, Hezbollah uh, tried also to target uh, gas facilities in uh, Israel uh, via drones. So seeing Russia uh, buying Iranian drones, first of all, uh, may create a sense of normalization or legitimization of the malus, of the misuse of drones by Iran. And second, it might further uh, project uh, uh, Russia's uh, power uh, across uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. So this is uh, another major issue. In terms of Iran and, is uh, and Russia rapprochement, um, there is a, another major issue that needs to be raised. It is that it came hand in hand, or I would say simultaneously, with not a change of position, but a change of tone um, between Russia and Israel. Russia has been increasingly aggressive when it comes to Israeli strikes in Syria. Russia has been vocal in condemning uh, those strikes. Uh, Russia, as you all know, uh, uh, threatened uh, to close the Jewish agency. Uh, for those of you who read uh, Russian and read the Russian press, uh, you may have been stricken by a sharp rise of uh, anti-Semitic statements and declarations, which is quite unusual. It comes usually during times of crisis in Russian-Israeli um, relations. Uh, so there is clearly a change of atmosphere. Again, uh, the rules of the game have not been changed. I, I mean, the Minister of Defense, Gans, um, acknowledged the fact that S-300 have targeted Israeli pilots um, during the summer. Uh, but aside from this, we haven't seen the de-escalation mechanism between Russia and Israel being canceled, uh, or we haven't seen um, uh, Israeli operations being dramatically challenged. If I may just um, um, add uh, uh, the Chinese perspective here into the conversation, because um, maybe we can use the last uh, or the next five minutes to um, to, to address this um, uh, topic, and then we can open the floor for uh, for questions. Um, so, uh, just to, to introduce the question, uh, China, a country that is seeking a more prominent place in the world order, uh, recent tensions with Taiwan, the visit of Nancy Pelosi, uh, Taiwan's industry is a strategic key to unlocking the status quo uh, power balance. China is also increasingly expanding pressure on the Middle East, uh, while the US has been withdrawing uh, some of its focus. So maybe um, you, you, you can, in, in the next five minutes, elaborate a little bit also on the Chinese perspective. And then I'm going um, to ask an initial really difficult question, if it's possible for you just in a, in a few sentences to, to connect these dots between China, Russian, and Iran. Uh, and then I'm sure the, the rest of the topics will will come up in the in the Q and A session that um, that we have. But then at least we 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 covered um, uh, the, those three topics um, uh, in this uh, half hour. Thank you, Mattis. Well, regarding China, uh, there are two ways that you can look at China in the Middle East. You can look at China in the Middle East in 2022, and you can look at China in the Middle East and North Africa in 2032. 
in 10 years from now. So when you look at China in the Middle East now, it is true that its current power in the Middle East is usually overstated. You know, it is reflected in the relatively low status of the Middle East in China's political apparatus. The Middle East is low in the order of China's priorities. Uh, and from a Chinese point of view, the Middle East is important for energy security, for the building of the Belt and Road Initiative, but most importantly, it's a low cost way to challenge the United States. Uh, but uh, from a security point of view, if you look at the Middle East from a Chinese perspective, there is a clear Chinese interest in keeping the United States strong in the Middle East because the United States is providing a security umbrella that enables China to expand its technological and economic presence across the Middle East. Uh, when China looks at the Middle East, it looks at uh, an area that is surrounded by Pax Americana. And so this is an area where they want the United States to stay in the security realm, but at the same time, they want to secure a long-term presence uh, in that area. Regarding China and Iran, it is important to note that, you know, we, we talk a lot about China-Iran strategic uh, partnership, but from a Chinese point of view, the GCC countries are much more uh, important in terms of priority, again, because of the markets that they do represent, because of China's concern regarding energy security, also because China is allergic to the destabilization um, efforts um, and activities that are led by Iran. China is um, tired of these activities. But when you look at the long term, if you see a continued US disengagement, if you see a Russian presence depleted or weakened, ultimately because of the economic crisis and because of the war in Ukraine, you may expect that China's presence in the Middle East could be converted in some kind of defense and security presence. And we could expect a growing cooperation between China and Iran, for example, uh, in space. We could imagine China renting out space surveillance capabilities to Iran that would be extremely dangerous for Israel. You could see a further cooperation in the, do in the domain of um, artificial intelligence. The weaponization of artificial intelligence, for example, uh, building kamikaze drones with the face recognition methods. So there is a real concern in terms of China's A, presence in the security field, and second, the ways in which China could uh, transform and embellish the technological capabilities of Israel's adversaries. And so if we, if we had to wrap up, well, it's difficult in one minute, but maybe we could wrap up with by mentioning uh, the Vostok military exercise of 2022 that is taking place next uh, week. Vostok is a major Russian military exercise taking place in the Sea of Japan and in the Russian Far East. And actually, this is the first time that the PLA will deploy air, naval, and ground forces. So it testifies to the growing crystallization of defense and military cooperation between Russia and China, Russia and Iran, and Russia, China, and Iran. And this axis is a major threat, not only to Israel, but to other moderate states across the Middle East and North Africa. Thank you uh, 